Carne is a delicious hearty stew made up of all the most southwestern flavors that exist in the culinary kingdom. Colloquially, it's usually just referred to as chili in modern times, but uh, the phrase chili con carne is Spanish. It literally translates to chili with meat. We, uh, we wanted to give you a little bit better of an explanation for that, but uh, like more literal than chili with meat, but uh, the word chili doesn't actually have like a translation. Like I never actually knew this, but like chili peppers, like chili is just the name of the peppers, like in old Mesoamerican languages, like Aztec and Mayans and stuff. It doesn't mean anything, doesn't translate anything. It's just, it's just a chili. It'd be like if there was like a fruit named after me, like the Eric fruit. Eric doesn't mean anything. It's just a name. It's, it's just Eric. It doesn't mean anything. Eric does have a meaning though. Oh, really? I Googled it. Eric, Do me- tell. Eric means always ruler and is Scandinavian in origin. <sighs> Cool. <laughs> in the case I was Always wondering, ruler. my name means pearl and is Welsh in origin. So together, we shall always rule the pearls. Yes. Or something like that. I don't know. We're getting off topic, though, and off topic was the last episode. That's true. Let's get back on topic because we're going to go off topic a million times in this episode, <laughs> just like every episode. Anyway, chili is very much one of those foods where just like everyone on the face of the earth has their own way of making it like their own little recipe they follow with all these little opinions about what it should be and what it shouldn't be what goes into it like if you're into cooking like even loosely you probably have a chili recipe of your own your mom probably has a chili recipe of her own your aunt probably has one your uncle has one your aunt's secret love child that you're not supposed to tell anyone about they have a recipe Part of the reason for this is because, similar to curry, there's no one exact definition of chili and how to make it. It's just a loose collection of similar ingredients and foods turned into a big bowl of foodie goodness. So despite that, uh, chili does tend to have a few common traits among the varieties of it. So notably, it's got to contain chili peppers or chili powder at the bare minimum. I mean, hell, it's called chili con carne, so without that... I don't know, without chili con, car- chili con carne without chili, it would be like throwing a scoop of ice cream onto a plate and saying, who's ready for some apple pie a la mode? With, with, without the pie. <laughs> Next up, uh, considering that it's chili con carne, carne meaning meat, uh, it also gets meat in there as well. Though, you do see a lot of vegetarian chili nowadays that leaves out the meat because vegetarians just can't seem to get enough of non-vegetarian dishes for some reason, ironically. But that aside, the meat is typically ground or chopped meat, or it's most commonly beef. Sometimes you see turkey, though technically you really could just make it with whatever kind of meat you want. Like, you know, the liquid stew portion, uh, it's usually comprised of broth and juices from tomatoes, uh, other types of vegetables and stuff that break down when they're cooked and turning it into a stew. And beyond this, well, the sky's the limit. This is where the whole everyone goes their, got their own recipe comes into play. Frequently, you see onions, garlic, other types of peppers, a shit ton of different spices like cumin, coriander, pepper, bay leaves, cayenne pepper, or maybe cinnamon. Oh. Because <laughs> as we covered in the pumpkin spice episode, everybody's secret ingredient to everything ever is always cinnamon. <laughs> Lots of recipes call for cheese, either added in during cooking or as a topping. Sometimes you see oddball add-ins like soy sauce, balsamic vinegar, coffee, or cocoa. Honestly, it doesn't really matter because at the end of the day, it's a lot like curry. The whole idea behind chili is your goal is to just cook all these like different ingredients t- and tastes and all these awesome flavors into one unified, badass, super flavor conglomerate. Chili peppers have their earliest origins in Mesoamerica, where early South American peoples were farming them 5,000 years ago. Maybe even almost 9,000 years ago, based on some evidence. Interestingly... They're one of the oldest farmed crops in the world and were incredibly important to the cultures of early Mesoamerican civilizations who have been farming them for almost as long as they've existed. And um, yeah, contrary to a lot of the paleo diet arguments, farming has been around for a long time. It's not some weird, relatively modern invention that started some sort of doom and gloom misstep for humans like you hear in conversations about paleo. Uh, yeah, speaking of paleo shit, uh, I gotta say, I'm really, really glad that, like, it seems like the paleo movement is kind of calmed down a little. Like, it seems, you still, you still see garbage for it, but, like, it seems like it's, you know, moving on a little bit. Like, uh, I don't know, can we all just, like, go back to agreeing that, like, produce and vegetables and fruits are good and that farming overall is a good thing? 
Like, I don't know, it takes a real special kind of ignorance to soapbox about how we should stop eating vegetables. <laughs> like, think about that one. Like, corn, it's, it's great. Sweet potatoes, awesome. Beans, good for you. No, it's no good. It's all junk food. We shouldn't be eating those highly nutritious superfoods that contain high concentrations of vitamins and fiber. It's way better to eat large amounts of venison and beef and other red meats that raise your risk of cardiovascular disease. That's so much healthier than eating garbage like oats, and it's way better. That's how humans are supposed to live, with heart disease. Uh, in case you couldn't tell by the sarcasm, uh, honestly, the paleo diet is pretty sus. Like, very little scientific evidence backs up any of its health claims at all. Like, okay, in general, yes, Eating less processed food and less sugar is generally a good idea, and it'll benefit your health. But you don't need to buy into a stupid, like, 20-year-old fad diet and shove fistfuls of salmon into your mouth day and night to accomplish less processed food and less sugar. The idea of basing a diet off of an era which features no documentation of human diets, uh, outside of vague archaeological guesses, uh, the idea that that diet is going to give you super how superpowers is honestly it's fucking bizarre. It's it, it's just not verified by anything. Like it's it's really weird. Farming is a weird target to go after. Like the human population is just out of control. We need more farms. We need more produce in general, not less. And to everyone who thinks like, oh, humans were never meant to farm produce. We're the only animals to ever do that. Ho ho, do I have bad news for you guys? Cause uh, other animals practice agriculture as well. Certain types of fish and crabs and weevils all practice basic animal kingdom forms of farming their food. And uh, beyond that, ants, who ironically are probably like the closest animal civilization to human beings out there, they just flat out grow fungus crops in special little farms, just like humans do. Leafcutter ants, true to their name, they send workers out and they bite apart pieces of leaves, they take the leaves back to their colonies, and then they leave the chewed up leaves in like these special farm chambers, and fungi and mushrooms and stuff grow on the leaves. The ants go in, they eat all the fungus, they harvest it, which they use as food, they grow food, and then they clear it out, and then the process starts over. They repeat that, get new leaves, and that just goes on forever for the duration of the colony's lifespan. That's literally farming. That is exactly what humans do, just on a smaller ant level. Oh, and while we're on the subject, ants are basically ranchers, too. Like, ants are actually really freaking cool. What they do is they seek out aphids and mealybugs and other small little dumb bugs that release honeydew, which is... Uh, well, it's not the melon. <laughs> kind of like a yeah, it's kind of like a sweet sugary goo that some insects excrete. I'll leave it at that. Gross. Anyway, uh, certain ants will seek out these bugs and harvest their weird like sugary honeydew pea, and they corral them up into little areas where the ants can defend them from predators and keep them safe. They're just like little itty bitty cattle ranchers, and they drink all that like honeydew stuff, and they bring it back to their nest, and they pass it around and give them to anyone. So, I don't know. I want to be more excited about that, but can't really because aphids and mule bugs are uh, they're, they're assholes. They they kill house plants, so it's cool, but also fuck you ants. Don't defend aphids. <laughs> aphids suck. And don't even get me started on mealy bugs. I hate those fuckers. Mm. Those watching on YouTube will see that our plants are finally free of their nets. I think we finally have our mealy bug situation under control. But I'm gonna stop mentioning them now in case it's like a Beetlejuice situation. Good idea. Um, for context, like rewind a few episodes ago, we mentioned we purchased a box of ladybugs to just let loose into the apartment. Uh, we put them on to the plants here, put netting over it so they couldn't escape. And those little guys, they worked their asses off. They, they got rid of the mealy bugs, knock on wood. And there's a few left of them too. So we, after the nets were taken off, we put them, I have a vivarium with like live plants and, uh, they're living in there now. So good for them. Anyway, let's reel it back. As much as I love a nice, random, uncalled-for rant at the beginning of an episode, we do need to get back to the origins of chili. As mentioned, chili peppers were endemic to South America since ancient times and became ingrained in their culture. They were used as food, used as medicine, and their spicy nature even let them find usage as an early pest deterrent. That's pretty cool. Makes sense. I guess if you lit a bunch of them in a bonfire there's not a lot of animals that are going to want to stick around in your little like hut for much longer yeah. well i mean unless you had one of those like chili head dudes that you hear about that like they set out to eat like the spiciest foods that they can find for like i don't know the excitement of it i guess like 
I actually sort of used to be like that when I was younger. I loved to, to like challenge myself to eating really spicy food. You know, up until I got into my like mid to late 20s and my body just wouldn't cooperate anymore. Like looking back, uh, it's kind of dumb. I don't know. I feel like there's better ways to get your thrill seeking fix than like, uh, you know, the adrenaline rush of feeling like your ass turned into an active volcano for 20 minutes straight. While we're on the topic of spices and seasonings, another one of the major ingredients in chili and lots of Tex-Mex cuisine is cumin. Yeah, cumin, which is originally native to India, uh, it's made from the ground seeds of its eponymous plant, the cumin plant, which is related to carrots and celery. So the way that we like to describe cumin is that basically it smells like armpits and it makes everything taste like a taco. Really selling it. <laughs> Seriously though, the uh, the pungent nature of it though is why it's important to chili con carne, cause like it imparts this like warm, earthy flavor, which is part of what makes chili taste so hearty. Uh, you know, as much as everyone likes to dress their chili up with like 37 different ingredients and go on about what the real secret to good chili is, at its heart, the two most important tastes of chili are the cumin and well, the chili itself. So chili powder. Chili powder, as its name suggests, is dried crushed chili peppers turned into powder. It was originally invented in 1894 by a German immigrant, of all things. <laughs> William Gebhardt, specifically, was a German-American restaurateur who owned a cafe in Texas who was looking for a way to preserve some of the fresh produce and food he used in his food. Chili peppers specifically weren't available in the States year-round and were a late summer crop in Texas, which is ironic considering how vital they are to most Tex-Mex cuisine. Yeah, this guy Gebhardt, he got around this problem when he had the idea to dry chili peppers out and dehydrate them and then grinds them up into a spice mix, which retains that same chili pepper flavor. And it became a smash hit among more northern states in America, where chili peppers were like this strange exotic food they'd never heard of. Interestingly, this guy Gebhardt, his brand was so successful and beloved that like it's actually still around today, like almost 150 years later. Like you could go buy like Gebhardt spice or Gebhardt chili powder right now on Amazon or if you find it in stores. So like good for that dude. Yeah. That's cool. Going back in time to look at more origins for chili, Aztec culture actually had a pretty wide variety of cool foods that honestly sound pretty good compared to a lot of other earlier civilizations. In addition to chili peppers, they had a lot of squash and beans and other veggies. As we mentioned in our peanut butter cups episode, they grew peanuts too, and they had tomatoes. Actually, on that note, fun fact, tomatoes, yes, were used in food in Aztec cuisine. However, they were also frequently given away as a gift as well. Usually they were given uh, to newlyweds. Newlyweds would get like bundles of tomatoes as kind of like an old timey wedding present. Man, no one gave us tomatoes when we got married. Well, we did get a banana though. Yeah, that's uh, that's not a joke, folks. Uh, for our wedding registry, we got a banana. So uh, for our registry, we we're using Target's website, and we saw that you could add any like SKU listing from Target's database and inventory, whether it's in their registry for like weddings or not. So I jokingly just added a single banana to our wedding registry. I marked it as one of our most wanted gifts. And lo and behold, on the day of our wedding shower, we totally got a fucking <laughs> banana. I thought we'd either get like 20 bananas or no bananas. But we just got one single banana. Yep. Actually, um, yeah, real talk though. It's for the best we didn't get a tomato as a wedding gift. Banana was better because... Uh, Apparently, the Aztecs traditionally gave tomatoes to newlyweds because they saw them as like a sign of fertility. Oh, and fuck that. <laughs> yeah, no, nah, we don't need fertility. For, forget that. Uh, but yeah, obviously, the Aztecs, they ate a lot of grains and cereals and like uh, like corn and amaranth and chia. When I say cereal, I mean grain crop cereals, not like modern breakfast cereal. <laughs> Although I do really love the mental imagery of this like grand ritual feast where they're cooking up all these like tasty fresh vegetables and stews and like meat they just hunted. They're milling their corn and making fresh baked tortillas. And then on the end of the table, there's just like a box of Lucky Charms. <laughs> uh, in addition to farming produce, the Aztecs also had a wide variety of meat as well. They hunted turkeys and other game fowls, a lot of fish. Uh, they hunted random other stuff like iguanas and gophers and crayfish and uh, salamanders. Sure, why not? Really can't picture what you're getting out of eating a fucking salamander. <laughs> but, like, uh, so, honey, how's your grilled axolotl salamander? Dry, flavorless, and I ate it in one bite. 
Whoa, would you rather have another small meatless amphibian that spends most of its life buried in the mud? Um, uh, maybe later. They were also big into seasoning their foods and used salt. They used cocoa to flavor dishes as well. Honey was another tasty food stuff they used in cuisine. Oh, and uh, they also ate people too. Like, yeah, people, people. Uh, you know, they, they were cannibals. <laughs> that's not a joke. They, uh, that's not a stereotype. Like, the whole human sacrifice thing. Well, uh, let's just say that wasn't just like some weird spooky tale. They legit would just like kill people and, and eat them and cook them since they believed human flesh was like the food of the gods. So eating a human sacrifice, it was supposed to purify you since only gods could normally eat people. Hot take, but you know, honestly, I think I get behind eating human flesh in like the right scenario. Like, seriously, I know that's one of the biggest taboos out there. Don't eat people. But, like, I don't know. I'd try it just to say I did. Though, like, yeah, I don't know. It would need to have, like, some, like, real hardcore rules and prerequisites to make sure that it's, like, you know, doing it right. Like, they need to be, like, really healthy and not gonna eat, like, a meth head or something. Like, that's just, like, that's just gross. That's unsanitary. Uh, like, it needs to be, like, a random person, not someone who was, like, specifically raised, like, a chicken for slaughter. Like, that, that'd be super fucked up. And, uh, you know, I shouldn't say, like, a random person. Like, I don't want to just eat, like, a, I don't want to just, like, shoot someone on the street and, like, eat them. Uh, no, rather, like, it need to be, like, punishment for something. Like, you know, someone who, like, just totally deserves the death penalty. Like, an, an unrepentant murderer or a rapist. Something that just can't be rehabilitated. Like, I don't know, uh good situation would be like maybe like hitler like a good situation like they arrest him they try him he's guilty and he's like fuck you i regret nothing because i'm hitler and so they're all just like all right preheat the oven boys we got some trimming to do but like what if eating a person you're at risk for inheriting their spirit or something Ooh, that's true. I don't want, like, an evil Hitler spirit. Uh, if that's the case, I probably wouldn't eat Hitler or, like, Stalin, because that's kind of risky. Um, or, you know, it needs to be someone, like, less evil and just, like, dumb, like... Oh, you know what? I got it. You know what? Here we go. Best case scenario. Best cannibal scenario. <laughs> Ingrid Newkirk, the longtime president of PETA. She's a remorseless asshole who runs an organization that lies to people and guilts them into giving them money and harnesses the power of shame to bully any organization that isn't directly linked to them. Oh, and best of all, so, uh, she's absolute fucking perfect irony of her being a vegan. That's just like the, mwah, that's like the chef's kiss ter cherry on top. And, and, uh, you know, if any of you think I'm being a little cruel here, joking around, but like eating the, the, the CEO of PETA, then, um... Maybe you like to donate money to PETA and, like, you, you think they do good. You know what? Tough shit. Do some more fucking research on PETA. Go to PETAKillsAnimals.com. Research PETA controversy. Whatever. Have your eyes open. PETA is a borderline domestic terror organization. It's one of the most emotionally manipulative organizations in history. They swindle rich idiots and gullible morons into thinking their money's going towards, you know, animals in need who need help. But uh, meanwhile, the majority of their money and their donations goes towards propaganda, which is mostly just trolling other organizations and employing workers that abduct and kill family pets. That's not a joke. They just, they, they kill like 97%, like upwards of 90%, 90 to whatever of the animals they take in. They're not an animal shelter. They don't do any good for animals. Fuck PETA. I would give away my entire life savings just to eat an Ingrid Newquirk burger. Whew. That said, this is all just theory. No one come after us, please. We're not going to kill anyone. No eating anyone. And don't take Charlie and kill him. Yeah, if PETA <laughs> came and abducted Charlie and... Um, then I would let you have the burger. Yeah, I then, yeah, I can't guarantee I wouldn't go fucking do something that makes me land in jail if they kill Charlie, so... <sighs> Moving away from human sacrifice and cannibalism... Over the years, the Aztecs formulated a lot of tasty dishes thanks to the wide variety of tasty foods that had access that uh, the tasty foods that they had access to. Notably, there's records from the 1500s that they had begun cooking up stews made using chili peppers, meats, and veggies, which are basically an early predecessor to what would become chili con carne today. Yeah, there's actually documentation of uh, another dish, uh, dish eaten that would later become like uh, in Arizona in the 1730s. It seems like another chili prototype. This one was described by a Swiss Jesuit, Philip Segerser. 
The stew was made of roasted pureed chili peppers combined with lard and chunks of meat. Obviously that one was a little bit after the Aztec Empire, but Southwest is just like all this like good shit stirring up like uh, literally. <laughs> Not shit literally, but soups getting stirred up. <laughs> then a century later in the 1800s in Mexican cuisine, there was a recorded recipe for these weird dried soup blocks made from dried beef, suet, chili peppers, salt, and other spices. These were almost like a primitive form of bouillon cubes, since they could then be boiled in water to create a spicy beef stew. Recipes like this were actively paving the way for modern chili to be invented. Though, actually, as we're about to cover, the actual creation of chili con carne is a little bit debated, with some people claiming it was created in Mexico, but then there's recorded documentation of Mexican culture in books rejecting the claim, like going out of their way to say, nope, nope, not a, it's not a Mexican food. They're defined as an American food, but... uh. Other historians believe it was invented in Texas, and that checks out considering the state's just fascinated with it to the point that it's now adopted as Texas's state food in present day. So with all that in mind, let's get nitty and let's get gritty, because now it's time to take a look at the history and the invention of today's topic. <laughs> 